All right. Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday, everyone. Today is March 21 of 21. So 21 of 21, 2021, the year, March 21. Hope you're doing well out there. If you're not familiar with our ministry, this is our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. And the ministry, the official name is Restoration Fellowship. And we are a sort of, as Sir Anthony likes to call it, a clearinghouse for truth seekers and finders all over the world. And sometimes we're asked what uh, we do exactly, especially with your generous donations. So for more than 20 years now, we publish a magazine called Focus on the Kingdom. And this is mailed out to at least 70 countries around the world. That's 7-0. And you can also access the magazine online for free as in the form of a PDF you can share and copy and so on. And we also host a, an annual theological conference. Again, you can go to our links, as you saw there, click theological conference. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic this year, we're doing it online once again, so we cannot be together. But uh, we're praying that uh, by next year, hopefully, uh, things will be, quote, back to normal relatively. So we look forward to you maybe coming for the first time and uh, joining us. And this is, again, a forum for truth seekers and uh, truth finders, as we call it. <clears throat> and before COVID, before the pandemic, um, we were doing a lot of mission work in uh, Russia through Tracy Z our partner in, in missions, and this is her website, klgmissions.com. Please check it out, Tracy Z. She lived in Russia for 20 years, so she has a lot of uh, heart and passion for that part of the world. We also do mission trips to Europe, Turkey, uh, uh, here in the America, Central and South America. And we also have believers around the world, Croatia, uh, France, Switzerland and many other countries. So check out uh, her ministry there and the theologicalconference.org for uh, further details. May 27, we will start the live stream. So apologies for those who wanted to come, but uh, due to the pandemic. All right, what else can we say about our ministry? We have a big online presence. We have three more websites you can access on the links. The Human Jesus, Christ Enemy Love, and Jesus Kingdom Gospel. So all devoted to separate topics, as you can appreciate. Human Jesus, Christology, uh, Kingdom Gospel, obviously. The Gospel about the Kingdom of God and so on. Uh, we also ship a lot of books worldwide. And you can click on books through Amazon. You can get your hands on Anthony's latest book, which is the second edition of his One God the Father, One Man Messiah translation with his commentary. This is one of the few non-Trinitarian translations of the New Testament. Unfortunately, we won't have we will not have time to do an Old Testament. I wish we had more time, but <clears throat> so please check that out as well. And also, last but not least, the YouTube channel. As you can see there, focus on the Kingdom channel. And we have, we're nearing 10,000 subscribers. So if you have not subscribed, just hit the subscribe button and, and the little bell. And I think we're nearing, was it 3,000 or 4,000 videos? So check that out. And uh, we have a playlist. You can go by topic there. And uh, you can have a look at that. All right. So we will begin, as usual, with Sir Anthony reciting the Shema for us. Tell us what the Shema is, why it is important, or it should be important for you. 
in your life, your Christian life, and uh, and then he'll open up with prayer. Good yeah. morning, Anthony. Yeah, good morning. Good introduction. Thank you very much for giving us that uh, publicity. Truth finders and truth seekers, as you rightly said. So the Shema, that's a Hebrew word from the verb Shama, means to listen, pay attention, obey. Don't miss this. It's the most important thing. In fact, Jesus said that the greatest and supposedly great command of all, the one you must not get wrong, is the listen Israel, the Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And Echad is the cardinal number one. Your child of two understands the number one. It's not difficult. So that's the creed of Israel. It's the creed of Jesus. And if you want to sound like Jesus and think like Jesus, then surely you'd start with the most superlatively important command of all in Mark 12, 29. Listen, Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord, one person, not three persons. That idea had not crossed the minds of any of the Bible writers. So with that in mind, then, we are going to hand this back to Carlos after I have opened with prayer this morning, if I may do that. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for another marvelously brilliant day here in Georgia with the sunshine, with the glory of your hand in nature, the flowers and the streams and the trees, so many good things. We thank you for the degree of health that you've given to us, that we can be up and about active, enjoying the words of scripture, sharing them with other people. We pray for all the children who listen to the children's lesson upcoming for all those around the world who may be tuning in by this miracle of the internet. We thank you for all of that. We ask you to bless us now. Help us to communicate clearly with each other. Help us to grow in grace and strength for the weeks and months that lie ahead for the tribulations that we will be facing as we look forward to the coming of your kingdom for which we pray today earnestly. May your kingdom be established in the earth. We ask you to bless us now with your operational presence and power, your spirit, the spirit of Jesus. And we thank you, Messiah, too, for dying that excruciating death on the cross so that we might be spared from the wrath of God and that our sins would be covered. We thank you for all of this now and our prayers offered as it is week by week in Messiah's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. So. Today, we will continue our reading of Isaiah, the great book of the prophet Isaiah. We are in chapter 49. Anthony will, as usual, take us through that and give us his commentary. If you have any other questions, we do a Q&A every other week. The next time will be uh, next month. Wow. So this is the second last week of this March month. I, so the next one should be Friday. We usually do it on Friday, April the 2nd, if you want to mark it down. Friday the 2nd, 7.30 p.m. New York or Eastern Standard Time usually. Now, I know we throw a lot of things at you Sunday mornings, unlike uh, most churches. So we have a youth lesson coming up with uh, Barbara Buzzard. And then I uh, usually do a little sermonette. So if you have any other questions about those topics we covered in youth lessons and my little sermonette, I would ask you to please keep your questions and comments focused uh, on the Isaiah 9, uh, 49 main sermon with Sir Anthony. And your other questions, you can email me, carlos at thehumanjesus.org. One word, the human Jesus. Org, and we appreciate your focus for the main sermon only this morning. All right, so I will bring up uh, Barbara, and she will give a lesson on the parting of the sea. Good morning, Barbara. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yes, the parting of the Red Sea. And the event I'm talking about today is one of the most exciting and action-packed in biblical history. It's the escape of the Israelites led by Moses while being chased by Egyptians. And it's no small group either. There were at least 600,000, some people estimated as closer to 2 million. If you will remember, 
After the plagues, Pharaoh finally let the people go. After they fled from him, he realized what he had done in letting all his slaves go. After all, who would do all the work? And he told his armies to go after them. So try to imagine these people in a dry and barren land and fleeing from the enormous armies of Pharaoh. There had to have come a point when they could actually see and hear the sea in the distance. I would imagine that when that happened, they began to grumble and be very afraid. The sea was huge. There was no solution in sight. The sea in front of them, their enemies chasing them from behind. No U-turn possible. How quickly they forgot about God and his power and what he had already done for them. Before God intervened in this situation, any observer would have said that the Israelites were dead meat. Talk about being up against it. They were facing a giant sea with no means of escape and they were being chased by their worst enemy. These Israelites complained to Moses, according to Exodus 14, 11. They said it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They were obviously terrified and had no hope at all. And continuing in Exodus, Moses did not reply in anger, but he comforted them as he said to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you will have only to keep still. When he said, <clears throat> excuse me, when he said that they would never see those Egyptians again, that must have been hugely puzzling, but it shows that God had a plan. Let's have a look at what the scene may have looked like. God told Moses that he would have, have victory over Pharaoh to prove that he is the Lord. He then told Moses to raise his hands and hold out his staff over the sea and divide it. He did. And God parted the waters of the sea. He also caused a strong wind to blow all night, drying up the sea, the sea floor, so that they could walk on a dry seabed. Apparently they crossed all night long. At dawn, the Egyptians finally reached them and tried to capture them in order to force them to return to be their slaves. However, God had a different plan. Once the Israelites were all safely across, Moses lifted his arms again and the sea closed. All the Egypt Egyptians were drowned. Carlos has some marvelous pictures now of what this scene may have looked like. Can we have the pictures? Yes, please. All of them. I think we have five pictures for you. That's an interesting one, isn't it? As if from above, the hugeness of that sea. And that also is very interesting with walls of water on either side of the Israelites. And that we believe is them coming out of the Red Sea. Fascinating, thank you. Are we surprised at God's display of power? I noticed it last week in Isaiah 48, uh, 13. God says that he laid the foundations of the earth and that his right hand spread out the heavens. Then it says, when I summon them, they stand at attention. That's such a powerful image that it makes them sound like dominoes. And in my imagination, 
perhaps God dividing the Red Sea was no, no more to him than opening curtains with his tremendous power. What lessons are there for the people of God? Several. Firstly, that God knows what he's doing. He hadn't led them out on the road that might have made the most sense, avoiding the sea, but he knew what he was doing. God leads the way. All that we have to do is follow, obey, trust. God will give us wisdom, direction, and guidance. Thirdly, we don't have to be afraid. God has a plan. And for an unforgettable lesson, there's something here that we absolutely must not miss. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 2, to bring this lesson home to us. What connection could there possibly be between these ancient relatives of ours and ourselves? It says in 1 Corinthians, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. God brought them all safely through the waters of the sea on dry ground. As followers of Moses, they were all baptized in the cloud and in the sea. I repeat that last part. They were all baptized in the sea. This is a model for us, an example for us to follow. Although this happened so very long ago, there are similarities with today. Remember that as the Israelites were basically dead meat without Moses and God to rescue them, we are also, in a sense, dead in our sins without a rescuer. But as with the Israelites, God has provided rescue for us in the person of Jesus. That is why he's called our Savior. Our part is to repent of our wrongdoing and to acknowledge that in the act of baptism, we are dying to our sins, our former lives, by being baptized and coming up out of the water as new persons on the path to the kingdom of God. As the Israelites had a new beginning, so, so too baptism is only a beginning. The battle is still on because Satan wants to have us. Baptism does not mean easy sailing ahead. It means that you've taken the first step. It does not mean that you are home and dry. Acts 2.38 spells it out clearly for us. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is step one with the obedience, uh, which is to follow, as in Hebrews 5.9. We must also take a very serious warning from the Israelites' history, because even though they experienced this very great miracle, we are told in 1 Corinthians 10.5 that afterwards God was not pleased with most of them. So we are to be aware of that example and not be disappointing to God. That same God who divided the Red Sea is our God, the one with all power. Whatever we face, the most difficult of all situations, we can face using the advice and believing the promises that God has given to us. And I'll finish with that beautiful Psalm 94:14. The Lord will not forsake his people, for they are his prize. All right. Thank you, Barbara, for that that reminder of the parting of the Red Sea, showing God's awesome power there and his promise that he kept to the Israelites. Okay. Okay. Um, we will move on now. I'll, I'll do a little sermonet. We have some time here, and then I'll throw it back to Sir Anthony for discussion on the main sermon. Again, please try and keep your um, questions 
to the main sermon at hand and uh, give me a minute here just have to yes and any other questions we have a Q&A like I said next Friday which is the first week of April so all right so let's see I want to talk to you a little bit about the ministry of Jesus this morning if I can get this PowerPoint working so this is a part of what I have called a new covenant series that you can find on the online okay give me a minute here apologies <clears throat> <clears throat> trying to share my screen with y'all see if this works there we go so yes a new covenant series and you can find more on our YouTube channel that I've done over the years on this topic that's why I call it a series obviously so okay let me see if this works again. Sorry. I was trying to set it up. Okay, in Matthew 5.17. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses, but to keep it. Galatians 3.22. The law of Moses was our guardian, says Paul, until Christ died. Hebrews 10.9. Jesus did away with the first, that is the first covenant, by keeping it in order to establish the second, that is covenant, with his death. So by now you might have guessed, I hope, that's not how these verses read, because these are things the Bible never said about the work of Jesus in relation to the law of Moses, or what some call the Torah and the New Covenant. This is the way most Christians seem to understand these verses, however, because they continue to misapply, therefore misuse, words like inaugurated, established, and made when it comes to the New Covenant. So I have a question for you this morning. When exactly did Jesus inaugurate the new covenant law, thus making the old covenant law of Moses, the Torah, something no longer to be obeyed and observed? The Gospels show that Jesus began to establish to make his new covenant law by his ministry or more specifically by his teachings. For example, note the so-called six antitheses in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 between the law of Moses and the law of Jesus. In other words, note the contrasts that Jesus makes by his teaching regarding murder, lust, marriage and divorce, vows or oaths, lethal self-defense and on the topic of the enemies or loving your enemies now if we take only the last two examples from this list numbers five and six we clearly see how jesus has effectively undermined and thus overruled torah on this point for example under moses God commanded the Israelites not to show any pity. Deuteronomy 19.21 Your rule should be life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. But in Matthew 5, Jesus says, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. In verse 44, But I tell you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your child so, so that you may be children of your father in heaven 
I think the antithesis, the contrast is clear here between the old covenant system represented by the Torah, the law of Moses, pertaining to personal and judicial punishments and what Jesus then says when he starts with, but I tell you, these old covenant commandments stand overruled clearly. The fact that this new covenant law of Jesus was inaugurated or established with his ministry and teachings, not at the cross, is shown by his very words at the Last Supper as well. Jesus said that this, this is an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And as we know, any covenant has to be made out of words and works. So where are the words and works of this new covenant law to be found? In the teachings of Jesus and not just at the cross. Simply put, my friends, <clears throat> the new covenant began, came into effect with the teaching of Jesus and was officially ratified, or if you will, certified at the cross. As a result, during the ministry of Jesus, he was already functioning as the high priest, the Melchizedek figure, the mediator of that new covenant law, and not the old covenant law of Moses, as Hebrew 9 makes clear. For where there is a covenant, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. So I hope uh, that helps with our continued dialogue on this very important topic of the new covenant, uh, between the new covenant and the old covenant. Again, please, I must remind you, if you have any questions, any other questions about what I just said and what Barbara taught, please, please try and keep your comments. If you are watching us live, uh, to the main sermon coming up, which is Isaiah 49. And if you have any other questions, Carlos at thehumanjesus.org. And I'm happy to share any PowerPoints or any other material that uh, you see here on the screen, especially from me. So I would most appreciate that. And Sir Anthony would also most appreciate you keep on topic, please. Okay, so Anthony will help us yep. through our reading here of Isaiah. Anthony, yep. if you want to take it away, please. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. That's a very good introduction. And you tackled the most important topic currently. You established the fact that Jesus is the mediator of the new, not the old covenant. There is a very great falsehood running around in theological circles these days, which denies Jesus as the mediator of the new covenant. It actually says that Jesus was really a faithful Israelite keeping the old covenant. That is absolutely false. That is a way to reject Jesus, not to accept him, to slap him in the face, if you like. So Carlos's point there is most welcome and most essential to our understanding. So we're in the 49th chapter of Isaiah. This is a whole fairly long chapter. All I can do is to give you some points and connections that I think will give you a sense of how this marvelous book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters of it, fits into the grand scheme that God is working here, his, his destiny for the world. And there is an article at our site called The World's Destiny, The World's Destiny at our Focus on the Kingdom website. I would recommend you read that. It's only four pages, but Carlos has this extraordinary way of finding stuff quickly. The Promise to Abraham is one of them. There it is, The World's Destiny, free article. Everything is free there in those articles. 
And you will find that interesting. It's actually quotations from one of the standard commentaries. But look at the top there, the prophets. And we're doing the prophet Isaiah. They speak a little else. Really, they're confining themselves to two topics. How and why God's people may expect to be punished by a variety of disasters soon. And number two, why they may expect to be rescued and restored eventually. That is brilliant. That gives you a handle on all the prophets say. So in my own uh, easy language, I would say, here's what the prophets say. As you go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets, things are going to be very bad, number one. But in the end, it's going to be very much okay. And that's putting it mildly. It's going to be fantastically great in the long term. But for the moment, there may be problems and trials in your lives. And as we watch things in America currently, there's a certain degree, I should say that's an understatement, a large and high degree of chaos. But beyond this, eventually, when Jesus comes back, and that's why you're to pray, Jesus said twice there in the Lord's Prayer, may your world government, your world empire, your world dominion come quickly, Jesus, please, to save us from the chaos that we're creating here in the world that you've given us. So with that in mind as background, looking at Isaiah 49, and it starts then by saying, <coughs> excuse me, listen to me. That sounds like the Shema, doesn't it? Pay attention. The story of our human society is that God speaks in the pages of Scripture in various ways, as it says in Hebrews 1, in different ways, and we tend not to listen. So God keeps arguing with the human race. And here is a classic case. He says, listen, pay attention. This is for your own good to listen to what God is saying. And he addresses the islands. I like to think of the Western Isles there, even the British Isles. Islands around the Mediterranean area and west of that, the British Isles and the whole world. Pay attention. This is like a father speaking to a child. Listen, son, daughter, pay attention. You people from afar, wherever you are, you could be the islands, you could be far off. And then somebody called the Lord, all capitals, L. O R D. Your Bibles have carefully put that word, and it is in Hebrew, Yahweh or Yahovah. It wouldn't matter how you pronounce it, but probably Yahweh. So they write it in all capital letters to tell you. And here somebody is saying, somebody is referring to that Lord God who called him from the womb and from the body of his mother. He named me. He, the Lord, L-O-R-D, all caps, named me. And you're saying, well, who is this person who's talking here? Verse 2, it says, he, the Lord God again, has made my mouth. And you're saying, well, who is this speaking? God has made his mouth, this person who's speaking here, like a sharp sword. What would that mean? What this person that we're going to discover in a moment who this is, has a very sharp sword coming out of his mouth. When he speaks, it can be very cutting, very telling, very trenchant. And in the shadow of his hand, God's hand, he, whoever this is speaking here, we're going to find out, he's concealed me. That's a, a good position to be, concealed in God's hand with the protective hand of God around you. And he, God, has also made me a sharpened arrow. Vivid images, right? Whoever this is who's speaking is very pleased with the situation for him. He's hidden me in his quiver. A quiver, I think, is to do with arrows, if I remember correctly. So he said to me, now we're getting to solve the problem. Who's talking to who here? The Lord God, capital L-O-R-D, standing for Yehovah or Yahweh, said to me, and who is this person? You are my servant, Israel. Ah, now we know. You are my servant, Israel, in whom I show my glory. My goodness, that's a very valuable position to be in. This individual is pleased with his destiny because he is God's 
servant. And he's also called Israel. And God is going to demonstrate the glory. That's an exciting, bright, shining glory of God in the servant. And now the mood changes slightly in verse 4. But I said, this person who is happy to be God's servant, and yet there's a downside to it. The servant then says, I've labored in vain. I've worn myself out, spent my strength for nothing and futility, or so it seems. And then he says, he pulls himself together and says, wait a minute, I better not be so negative. Nevertheless, the justice which is owed to me, which is due to me, is with the Lord. What does that mean, with the Lord? Well, it reminds you of John 1.1. 1, 1. The word was with God. And the justice that's going to come to this faithful servant is certainly going to come. And it's planned by God. If something is with you, the word was with God, it means the word, the plan, the idea was in God's mind. It was alongside him, his project. And he's looking for a reward. And so you should be. So let's unpack this a little further. If you are a true believer, believing the truth of the Bible, you count as part of this servant. Israel, the nation, we need to think of the wonderful economy of Scripture, where it can talk of one thing and mean several things at the same time. So there's something for everybody in the Bible. What is it you get out of this? You are also God's servant. First of all, the Messiah is that servant. I don't need to remind you, we don't need to turn to those passages, but in Luke and Matthew, you'll know that the Messiah came from the womb of his mother, Mary, by miracle, a miraculous conception, a miraculous begetting. So Jesus is not just a human being. Far from it. He's a uniquely brought into existence in the womb of his mother, a brought into existent person. And he is superbly and supremely God's servant. So that's the first reference I would have. But you had better be God's servant too. And the whole international Israel of God. So now we've got a lot of vocabulary to think about. The word Israel can certainly mean the one individual supreme Israelite who is Jesus. It can certainly mean the national ethnic Jews by blood and by uh, nationhood. And it can also mean you who are aspiring to function as a servant of God. So all of this applies to all of those categories of people. And then what we find is in verse 3, of Isaiah 49, God said to me, you're my servant Israel. Well, you are also the Israel of God. That's in Galatians 6.16. If you're taking notes, as you describe all of these things to your friends, I hope over the coffee table, Galatians 6.16, we don't need to necessarily find it, but if you're taking a note or two with a pencil, Galatians 6.16 speaks of the Israel of God, the international servants of God. That would be the true church of God. And the word Israel also means still ethnic Israel. They are presently blinded. They're not accepting Messiah. Yes, they were restored in 1948 to be a nation, but that was not in faith. So part of the story that you're going to see unfolding in these marvelous passages in the prophets is that Israel is in for a very bad time. Why? Because God is going to have to wake them out of their spirit spiritual lethargy so that they indeed function as God's servants as was intended. So you've got the picture. Jesus is the servant of God. You as a believer are servant of God and Israel, the nation, will yet function in a much better way than currently as servants of God. So that's the picture. Your I, mouth I mean then Yes, what do we got? Something by way of a question? What do we got? We're in verse 5. Actually. Verse 5, right. We'll do 5. Now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, that's firstly Jesus, to bring Jacob back. Jacob is another word for Israel. So that Israel might be gathered to him. That word gathered is a happy word in Scripture. Gathering. The saints are going to be gathered at the second coming of Jesus. So that's a happy restoration sort of word. They're going to be gathered. I'm honored in the sight of the Lord. 
This is the servant of God speaking. He is indeed, you are indeed honored in the sight of the Lord. And my God, you should be able to say, is my strength. So Jesus can say it, you can say it, and ultimately a vast number of people come will come to this happy condition. Then in verse 6, he says, Is it a small thing, a light thing, that you should be my servant? In other words, this is no small deal. This is a huge deal. And what is it? It's not just a, a nothing, a, a kind of a casual, not to be noticed sort of thing. It's a massive thing that you should be called my servant, Jesus and you and the Israelite people eventually. What is that purpose? To raise up, to produce the tribes of Jacob and to restore. Ah, there's a key Bible word. We said at the beginning, things are bad now but they're going to be amazing when God stretches forth his hand through his servant Jesus to restore the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light, God says to this servant person. I will make you a light. Didn't Jesus say that he was the light of the world? You know that. We don't need to turn to it, but just take a note of those verses but people don't remember that he also said, Jesus also said, you, my followers, are to be the light of the nations. So that my salvation might extend to the ends of the earth, across the globe. Isn't that a grand project for Jesus to have and for you to have? Because you're included in this work too. My salvation. What in the world is salvation? It means gaining immortality. People, you know, struggle with the advertisements on television to get a few more years of life, painless life perhaps. But the Bible talks about endless life, about attaining to a condition called salvation in which you cannot die forever. Can you imagine that? You need to ponder that day by day as you go about your work. Think about being immortalized. Well, Jesus saw himself as the servant of God propagating the only information that has ultimate, uh, ultimate meaning and talking about the future day, the only day that really counts in the whole of human history. So that day is the subject of Jesus' gospel about the kingdom. That's what Jesus was doing. And you should be doing because you are the mouthpiece of Jesus and of God. This is what the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One says to the despised one. Ah, now we get a little bit of a negative tone in the, in the text here. That servant of Jesus was, dis, a servant of God, I should say, was despised by his own people. Would you imagine that? The Jews actually killed their own Messiah. But it doesn't end there. Kings will see and rise. This is the positive end of through all of this suffering. Princes will also bow down. Because of the Lord God, Yahweh, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Oh, I get it. This servant, or in the case servants, you, have been elect. That's the chosen one. We talk a lot in America about election. Well, God has had an election too. He's elected his chosen servant, his chosen servants. This is what the Lord says in verse 8. At a favorable time, I answered you. On a day of salvation, I helped you. That's very positive. Look at this good news. I will watch over you and make you a covenant of the people. I'll make you and all the work you do to be an, agree an agreement with the people. Jesus then was the minister of the new, I repeat, the new covenant. I just want to refer to Luke twenty two twenty nine. 29. If you could take a note of it, we don't need to turn there necessarily. But Jesus said at the Lord's Supper, God has covenanted a kingdom to me. The word is hiding there in your translation. The word there is covenant. Jesus, one of the final things he said before he died, 
God has covenanted to give him a kingdom. And so he covenants to give you that kingdom. The whole of the new covenant is about giving you the whole world. How about that? A kingdom. The kingdom of God is the heart of the Christian gospel. And it's a promise that God is going to give that kingdom by covenant to Jesus and to you. And it's going to involve restoration, restoring the land, restoration, putting things back into a condition where they should be, from which they have been temporarily ruined. Now, saying to the prisoners, you see all these prisoners, look for the news here. Go free, prisoners. You can go. God is going to cause you to let to be let go, just as Barbara was saying with the Israelites. God brought them through the sea. To those who are in darkness and gloom, show yourselves, come out into the light, and they will feed along the roads, and their pasture will be on all bare heights, all sorts of good things. They will not hunger or thirst. This is when they're going to be restored. Nor will the scorching heat or the sun strike them down. Because God, who has compassion on them, will lead them and he will guide them to springs of water. All these wonderful things, the opposite of darkness, the opposite of imprisonment. And look, they'll geographically, they'll come from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Aswan, or from the east probably there, from the four points of the, of the compass, from the north, the west, and the south, and from the east probably. Some dispute about the meaning of that word there. It doesn't matter. Now look, 13, this is so exciting for Isaiah the prophet that he bursts into a shout of joy. The word sing in the Bible occurs 120 times. So when God and the prophets whom he inspired are so excited about what they're saying, they burst into an ecstasy of praise. Shout for joy, you heavens. Be happy, rejoice, you earth. Break forth into joyful shouting, addressing the mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people. That's the famous word that introduces the second half of Isaiah, where we started our studies some months back now in Isaiah 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Be happy, sing, because your trials and tribulations are over, and God will have compassion on his afflicted. If you want your children to understand that, I recommend you play to them the famous pieces from Handel's Messiah that so moved some of the kings and queens of England that when they got to the Hallelujah Chorus there, one royal personage in England said, we all need to stand up because the only kingdom that has ultimate value is the kingdom of God to be established by Jesus. Now then we turn to a slightly negative, a slightly more despondent view, just temporarily. Zion, well, who is Zion? This is Jerusalem. Zion said, by way of complaint, the Lord seems to have abandoned me. I'll put it that way. The Lord seems to have forgotten me. What? God says, wait a minute, only temporarily. And so God replies by saying, Look at a woman and a nursing child. Can a woman really forget her nursing child? Can a woman not have compassion on the son or daughter of her womb? Even thee, they might forget me, but I will not forget you. There's words of comfort then to believers, the servants of God. I will not forget you. That's comforting. You may be going through trials. You're suffering difficulties. It seems like a very dark time in your life. I, God, will not forget you any more that a mother can forget her nursing son or daughter. Look at this, 16. Behold, I, God, have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. I've written you right on, my, on the palms of my hands, like tattooing your name you might say, on the arm. And your walls, the walls of Zion, are continually before God. In other words, he's thinking of Zion and the joy and the excitement he's going to bring eventually to Zion in the Middle East and to the whole wide world. 
Look at the good things that are going to happen. Your builders are in a hurry. Those who destroyed you, ah, there's the negative side. There's going to be trouble, destruction, devastation. That's going to come to an end. They will leave you. Look up. Raise your eyes. Look around. All of them gather together. They come to you. Say, well, who's coming together? Well, they're going to be sons and daughters of Israel. Jews, if you're thinking of the future restoration of Israel, you as the servants of God who are going to be gathered in the kingdom, you're going to have lots of children, not necessarily physically, but you're going to inspire and beget children spiritually. As I live, declares Yehovah, Yahweh, you will certainly put these children on like jewelry and bind them on as a bride, all the most exciting prospects you can imagine, like a bride and going to a wedding. You're going to put on all of you're going to be having added to you children like you wouldn't believe, relatives, converts, if you like, those who swallowed you up. That's looking back to the bad time, that earlier time of tribulation. They'll be far away from you. And the children you lost will, let's say, will yet say, will still say in that future great time coming, the place is too cramped for me. I haven't got room here. Make room for me that I may live here. Then you will say in your heart, who has fathered these children for me? Since I was bereaved in the bad time, I became bereft of my own children and I couldn't conceive. And I was in exile, looking back to the bad time. So the bad time is the exile, the wandering. The good time coming is an incredible restoration. I was left alone, slightly negative approach in 21. Where did all these others come from? Well, Israel, you, the servants of God now, you, the yet unconverted Israel, the nation, you're going to have a future that is unbelievably brilliant. He goes on in verse 22. This is what the Lord God says at Adonai Yahweh, the Lord God or Elohim here, God, another word for God, Elohim. And we had the word Lord Yahweh already, Adonai and, uh, and Elohim. Look, behold, that word behold in the Bible always means pay attention. I will lift up my hand, God says, to the nations, to the Gentiles. I will set up my flag at the point to which you want to move, a geographical marker, and they will bring your sons in their arms. These foreigners then, in this good time coming, the restoration of the kingdom at the second coming of Jesus, they will bring your children, spiritual children and physical children, and your daughters will be carried on the shoulders of these Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to be in service to the Jews here. Kings, royal family of pagan nations, will be your guardians. And their princesses, the royal element in those Gentile nations, will come to work for you as nurses for your children. They will bow down to you. Israel is going to be elevated not to make them feel proud in a wrong way, but because God has chosen the people of Israel, what we roughly call Jews. Secondly, you as the international Israel of God to be leaders, supervisors, governors, honored people in that future kingdom. So other people have to come bow down to you. You'll find that even in Revelation 3, verse 7, people are going to have to bow down to the saints and admit that God was working with them. They'll lick the dust. That's a, a picture of complete humiliation. Gentile people in front of God's people. Firstly, Jesus, the servant. Secondly, the church, the servants. Thirdly, the yet still to be restored national ethnic Israel in the future. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. That waiting for God is something we're supposed to do daily. And waiting for the kingdom, as, as Joseph of Arimathea just referred to it there in, in Mark 15, Joseph of Arimathea 
was actually waiting. It's a very good position to be in, waiting for the kingdom, praying constantly, may your kingdom come. Indeed, this is what Yehovah, Yahweh says. Even the captives of the mighty man will be taken away. And the prey, those who were, were, were captive to the tyrant. Oh, a tyrant is coming on the scene. Who could that tyrant be? Well, there will be a future Antichrist. Antichristos, mentioned by Paul in Second Thessalonians 2. We'll just refer to it. Second Thessalonians 2.12, that whole chapter, marvelous, about the Antichrist. That's a personal name. That tyrant. The prey, those who became subject to that tyrant, will be rescued. That's good news. Look at this. I, God, will argue with the one who argues with you. And I, God, will save your children, your spiritual children, your physical children. Look at the revenge here. Look at the vengeance that is promised. Nothing wrong with justice. I will revenge. Vengeance is mine, God said in Romans. I will repay those who are doing you harm. I will feed your oppressors with their own flesh. What an awful picture. They'll be drunk with their own blood. I like the, I don't like it really, but I'm struck by the vivid way in which God gets his point across to us. Those, your former enemies, that tyrant and all of his anti-Christian people who attacked you will be drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. And humanity will know. The whole of the world will know once, finally, and for all that I, Jehovah, Yahweh, I'm your savior. I'm your redeemer, the mighty God, the one God of Israel, the mighty one. He gets the top hand at the end. He comes out on top. His victory is guaranteed. And along that, with that, then your victory is also completely assured if you'll just wait for it. All right. Thank no, you, Anthony. Okay. That's the, uh, where do we get to? Actually, the end of the chapter. I didn't know we'd gotten through all of that so quickly. That's amazing. Um, just yep. some comments here from myself Good. and others. Yes, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. This is why we're focused on the kingdom Absolutely. of God. Wouldn't, wouldn't you love to see that, folks? Yep. So I like the way you put it, Anthony. The, uh, it's like a window seat. You know, the yes. window seat. You have the best seats in the house. That's right. So these are the best seats in the house. Yes. Uh, a sort of peak we're peeking into the into the kingdom absolutely the good news this is the gospel folks this yes. is what it's all about this is the end game yeah i love i love the uh, the the use here of of the nations uh yep. being humiliated they bow down they lick the dust uh, <laughs> they lick uh, the, the feet of of the saints Yep. Uh, this, now, I want to ask you a, yep. uh, a question from myself here. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we see here language about that day, yep. the day of the Lord, right? The kingdom, mm -hmm. the kingdom age, the millennial yep. kingdom, millennial time, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, we see how the servant represents, obviously, all Christians. So we are made glorious too. Uh, yes. So it reminds me of John 17, 22. Jesus promises that the glory that he had with the Father, yeah. which the Father then has given him, he promises that same glory to us in John 17, 22, for example, mm -hmm. so that we may be one and so on. Yes. So the glory of the servant figure here. It will be obviously the glory of the church, of all saints, of mm -hmm. the Christians. Mm -hmm. So I love that language. There's also the language of the light to the nations. Yep. Uh, if you want to comment uh, quickly, Anthony, on Acts 13.47. We should do that because... Uh, um, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Uh, this text that we've been reading, we got through a chapter very quickly there, and I didn't turn to all the parallels that one might certainly referred to but in acts 13 37 you will find that paul and barnabas applied those texts to themselves isn't that fascinating it's on the, it's on the screen anthony 47 
30, uh, Jack 13, 47. Yeah, this is what the Lord has commanded us. This is Paul and Barnabas speaking. Exactly as I said at the beginning, this has a reference to Jesus, the servant, to Paul and Barnabas, the apostles, all servants of Jesus. So it was necessary to speak the word of God, meaning the gospel of the kingdom. Just remember that the word of God is not just the Bible. It means the message of the gospel of the kingdom. It was necessary, Paul and Barnabas said, Barnabas said, to speak the gospel of the kingdom to you first. But since you reject it, and therefore do not consider yourself fit for the life of the age to come. I'm glad that came on the screen. Eternal life means really the life of the age to come, the life in the future kingdom. So they said, all right, you're going to refuse it, you Jewish people. We now are going to turn to the Gentiles. We'll widen our scope. And since the Jews refused the message, God said, I'll now turn to the Gentiles. And so then Paul and Barnabas quote that very passage from Isaiah 49. Can we go back to that text? I can read it on screen where, where you just were. Yes. Uh, Isaiah 49, what verse? Uh, or the Acts thirteen forty seven. Yes, but it's quote it's quoting from Acts, Acts forty nine. Yep, hold on. Yeah. This you is Acts it. thirteen. Yeah. Uh, forty six, forty seven. Yes. There it is. Quoting from Isaiah, quoting from our very passage, really, I have made you a light. I've made you apostles in this case. You're the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. The apostle is the light of the world. Every true believer becomes a light of the world to instruct and to help the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And look at these good people. When the Gentiles heard this, they were reading them, the Old Testament, and hearing the exposition that Paul and Barnabas were giving. They rejoiced and glorified the gospel of the kingdom, the word of the Lord. And all who are appointed for the life of the age to come. That's to say, they responded, they repented, and they therefore became candidates for the life of the age to come by believing. That takes us back to Mark 1, where Jesus said, Repent and believe in the gospel of the kingdom. And the word of the Lord, the gospel of the kingdom, spread throughout that region. That's a marvelous companion passage then to Isaiah 49. Okay. Yeah, I had a, I had a question mm -hmm. also, Anthony, yeah. about, so we, we get a window seat here in Isaiah 49. Yes, I like that, yes. About the uh, the kingdom coming. Yep. Uh, we read a passage about uh, prisoners uh, yes. somewhere. Uh, yep. What verse was that? Sorry. If, um, uh, the prisoners are going to be set free in our passage there. Uh, verse 9 there. Verse 9, yes. Saying, mm -hmm. those to, saying to those who are bound, go free. To those who yep. are in darkness, That's right. uh, show yourselves and so on. Yep. In, in Luke 4, yes. uh, this is a question of mine, if you don't mind. Mm. No, of course. At the beginning of his ministry, yes. Jesus returns from the desert, from the temptation mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And his victory over Satan. Yes. And uh, it says he returns in the power of the spirit. Yes. And then he goes to a synagogue nearby. Yeah. Yes. And he takes the scroll of Isaiah. <laughs> yes. And he reads from a passage in, uh, I believe it's Isaiah 61. Yes. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the mm. poor, the good mm. news. He has sent me, that is, commissioned me to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captive. So it's similar yep. language. Absolutely. And then Jesus says something interesting. Well, yep. I, I, actually, mm -hmm. if you're a Jew, something earth-shaking. Yes. In verse 21, and, and that's my question. So in verse 21, he mm -hmm. says, today, yeah. this scripture is fulfilled yes. in your hearing. What yeah. did Jesus mean by the word fulfilled? Because obviously the kingdom hasn't yes. come. Well, the announcement of the kingdom, as in Isaiah, that kingdom is announced in advance. And of course, then, since Hebrews, Hebrew people think 
in huge blocks of thinking, not in this hair-splitting way that we tend to do in the West, but as I learned at the University of Jerusalem in 1974, a Hebrew thinks in big blocks at a time. So if you say it's fulfilled this day, what you mean is the announcement of that kingdom is being fulfilled right in your hearing. They grasp a totality. That's the phrase. I learned that. Hebrews gr can grasp a whole big thing. They don't chop it all up and sometimes make it more difficult than it is. So Jesus is certainly quoting Isaiah. They all knew that, referred to the kingdom. If you look at the beginning of Luke, you have Simeon, you have Anna, you have Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. They all are thrilled at the prospect of the kingdom. And so when Jesus is coming along and saying, well, I am the king of that kingdom and get ready for my kingdom, nothing could be more exciting than that. And that word restoration is so important. So we've got time to turn to one verse in Matthew 19, 28. I'd like to refer to that. Here's the acme, the center of restoration language. Matthew 19, verse 27. I want to read it. This is you now. Peter speaking for you. Peter said to Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. We gave up the fishing business to follow you. What are we going to get out of this? Nothing wrong with that question. That's a fair question. The Bible is a book of justice. If you give everything for a cause, you deserve to get something out of it. What then? will be in this for us. What do we get out of this? And Jesus said to them, you're going to go to heaven when you die. That's false. The Bible never, never ever speaks about going to heaven when you die as your reward. What did Jesus say? I'm giving you what Jesus said, not what popularly is preached. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, amen, I tell you, let me tell you with all the passion I can muster. When we have the renewal of all things, the renewal, the good time coming when everything that's now in chaos is going to be put back right, that's to say when the Son of Man, that's himself, will sit on his throne of glory, which he's not doing now. If you happen to have been caught by what's called our millennialism, you have gotten rid of the future by putting it in the past. You don't want to do that. You can go to Israel today. You will not find Jesus sitting on the throne of David. Therefore, the promise at his birth that God would give him, Jesus, the throne of David has not been fulfilled. You can go and see that for yourself. It's not there, but it's coming. And when that time comes and the Son of Man, the Messiah, will be sitting on his throne of glory, not glorious throne, but throne of of glory, then you, Peter, and all those who have followed Jesus correctly, will sit on thrones. What? You mean you are royal family? Yes. You are destined to be royal family or God's elect, and you too will sit on thrones to administer, not judge, that judge is a poor translation, to administer the regathered 12 tribes. So don't please say before God and man in a rather feeble way, well, if I can just be there and hold the door for a thousand years, don't say that. You have a job to do. Your Christian training, your Christian experience now is to function now in a way that is fitting and pleasing to God such that he says, I would like to put this person in charge of the world. That's what Jesus promised to the disciples, and the Bible is full of that. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, I'll just mention that, where they were having difficulty settling disputes in the church. They were arguing about something. They weren't settling their dispute in the church, and Paul said to them in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, in a moment really of frustration, Paul said, why don't you settle these issues in the church? Don't take your lawsuits or your squabbles or your arguments to pagan courts. Aren't you competent? I like that translation in 6.2. Aren't you competent to settle trivial suits? Have you forgotten, my good people, 
Paul said there that we're going to even dis uh, settle disputes of angels, judging angels. Before that, do you know that we will judge angels? Where's oh, there it is. Don't you know in verse two that the saints, that means all of the servants of God, the true believers, are going to administer. Judge is the wrong world there. The book of Judges were administrators. They were governors. You are in training to govern the world. And if the world is going to be administered, let's get this language clear. If the world, the whole wide world, is going to be administered, governed by you, you listening now as true believers, can't you even settle little trivial lawsuits in the church? Don't you know that we're going to actually administer angels? Well, then get busy and sort out your problems right now to prove to God and to yourself that you are fit for the destiny that we just read from Matthew 19, 28. If you have ordinary lawsuits, do you appoint as judges people outside the church who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. And I think God would say to us, to our shame now, you haven't grasped the vastness of the destiny, both of the world and your destiny as believers. You are royal family, if you like, in training now to fix the world on a tremendous scale. And if you're American particularly, that's really what you want to do. If I listen to the news, the only question they're talking about on the news is, who's going to govern this chaos? Who's going to make sense out of this nonsense? Well, the answer is you are. And you are in training to do that. Don't try to do it now. They're not going to appreciate you. But wait till Jesus says, take charge of five cities, take charge of 10 cities. Jesus is actually going to say to his faithful followers, well done, you good and faithful servants of God. Take charge of five cities, 10 cities. Why isn't this preached more extensively than it is? It's been my question for many years. Just another comment, Anthony, yep. if I may. Mm. On Isaiah 49, I love uh, verses 22 and 23. Yep. Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nation, set up yep. my flag to the peoples. They will bring your sons mm. in their arms. Mm. Your daughters will be carried on their cho shoulders. Yes. There will be servants. Yes. Uh, a type of slave, I guess. Servants, of course. Servants is the right English word, yes. Kings will be your guardians. Mm. Kings. Royal family. Kings will be your guardians. Yeah. Princes as your nurses. Yes. They will worship you, bow yes. down to you bow. with their faces to the ground, lick mm. the dust from your feet. Yep. Now, this reminds me of one of my favorite, uh, yep. what I call supremacy of Israel verses. Yes. Isaiah 45, 14 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Yes, of course. If you'd like to see my take on that, uh, please go back in the... Uh, couple of weeks ago, I, I did a little sermonette on this. Yep. Again, a view of the kingdom. Of course. Uh, products of Egypt, merchandise of Cush and other nations will yep. come over to you, will be yours. They will trudge behind you. Yes. I'm reading the NIV there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. Coming to you in chains. Yes. Wow. They will bow down, worship yeah. you. Yeah. Well, the and word worship, yes. Not the word worship. Don't forget, the word worship is not appropriate in English because in English, the word worship means you're worshiping God. But bow down is exactly right. They'll fall on their knees before you with enormous respect for you. We only worship God in English. In the Bible, though, that same word does for falling down, bowing down, doing obeisance. There's the right word, I think. And pray to you. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, and, and yeah. so it has a double, what I call a double yeah. whammy here of the yeah, bowing, absolutely. the worship. And yep. prayer language, yep, of course, uh, obviously, usually used for God, but mm. here it is uniquely yes. used for the redeemed Israel yep. of the future. Now, there is a question here, Anthony. Mm. Uh, yes, good on the chat about yeah. the uh, the Israel here in question. Yes. In this, uh, so you you've been talking about the Jewish people and so yes. on. So the question is. Is spiritual, quote unquote, Israel yeah. in the end, of the end time? Yeah. yeah. Is it both Jews and Gentiles who were uh, grafted back onto the olive tree of faith? 
Yes. Or is the Gentiles only here? No, that's a great question. But, you know, as I've tried to say, the Bible is a very economic book. It covers a lot of ground in one thing. The answer is that the Israel of God of Galatians 6.16 is a combination of ethnic Jews converted and Gentiles converted all together in one group. And so in the future, there's going to be a massive conversion of now blinded ethnic Jews. When they're converted, they're back grafted onto their own olive tree, which they shouldn't have left, but they did. In addition, the Gentiles are grafted into that one olive tree, making a complete group of Jews and Gentiles together who would be the true spiritual Israel. So that government of the future, the governing reigning group, will be a combination of all the nations, including now blinded Jews. I think that would be the answer. Not one or the other, one composite group of Jews and Gentiles. And we Gentiles right now have received the enormous privilege of being grafted into the Israelite olive tree. That's a huge privilege because Jesus is the uh, special figure, of course. He's the head of all of this, and he generously grafts in both Jews and Gentiles to be the one Israel of God now preparing to supervise the world. We should go back to Isaiah 42 just a second to back up. I think, Carlos, we have just a minute or two. In Isaiah 42, look how this same the theme in Isaiah 42, behold my servant. God is so excited about this. He goes on telling us about the servant whom I uphold. Put yourself in this place. You are a servant of God. It, the first reference would be to Jesus. My chosen one, that's you, the elect, in whom my soul delights. I'm so thrilled with my children, God is saying. I've put my spirit upon this servant of mine. That's Jesus, firstly. Secondly, you. And you and he will bring forth justice to the nations. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. This servant of God, Jesus the Messiah, firstly, you as a follower of Jesus, are going to bring justice to the world. Well, we have a certain Justice Piero, I think her name is, on television. She's full of prosecuting and, and, and searching for justice. But that's nothing compared with what's going to happen when God fills the earth with justice to the nations. And then it says he will not cry out. He won't need to yell and scream. And he didn't at the first coming, at least. And even a bruised reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick, he won't, he'll be very gentle at the first coming anyway, but he will faithfully bring forth justice. As Carlos rightly just said, that's the gospel. He will not be disheartened. He will not be crushed until the grand moment when he has established justice in the earth. That is the gospel of the kingdom, the only gospel there is, the gospel of the kingdom, the beginning of the gospel. You show your friends, Mark chapter 1, 1, the beginning. Don't start at the end of the gospel. Don't start in the middle. Start at the beginning. And that is also salvation. According to Hebrews, God spoke in the past through the prophets. And God spoke through his son. The public has been told, no, Jesus just died for you. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. But it's only half the story, even if it's a half. Maybe it's a third of the story. God spoke. Yes. Good. Yeah, thank you, Antonia. Right. This is a, a very, uh, uh, how should I call it, uh, extensive topic. I, I have yes. found if you are interested to learn what mm. what uh, some of us call the two Israels of God, yes, we have many videos, and this is, again, a very extensive topic, mm. and mm. I hope you continue to study it in case you need clarity. But we do offer some um, interesting uh, studies here. I have a couple, the uh, Unit 5 Eschatology 4 I did with my wife, as mm -hmm. you see there, Sarah, and we, Good. we did a little... Uh, Bible study there with other people you can watch. Good. And also I did a Bible study. So the wow. bottom line is, uh, this is the way I see it, Anthony, and yeah. I think we agree yeah. that right. there are really two Israels. The, yes, indeed. What Paul calls the Israel of the flesh. Yes. And you can read all about that in Romans 9 to 11. 
mm -hmm. uh, maybe even start Romans 7 to 11. Mm -hmm. And there's the Israel of the spirit, uh, yep. Galatians, you cited Galatians 6.16. So yes. there's really two Israels. And yes. the reason we say that is because you actually read the verse that alludes to the two Israels. And that's yes. Matthew 19, 28. 28 As yes. you see there, yep. you see the 12 who are Christians. Yes. That is followers of Christ who were Jews. Mm-hmm. And they will be governing or managing or judging whatever word you want to use. Yes. Look at that. The 12, the 12 tribes. So obviously in the future, in the kingdom. Yes. Oh, you know, God has a master plan yes. that I call the widescreen gospel. Yes. For all the nations, not just Israel, yes. not just the 12 tribes, but all the nations. And again, you can find extensive studies on this. Mm -hmm and teachings that Anthony has done and myself. Yeah. So here we we find this picture that there are really two Israels, the yeah. Israel of the Spirit, mm -hmm. the followers of Christ, mm -hmm. uh, represented here by the 12 who were Jews, and they will manage the reconstituted, yes. the redeemed, if you will, yeah. the remnant 12 tribes who are obviously Jews as well. Yeah. <laughs> so you have sort of Jews over other Jews, yep. if you will. If you want to expand on that a little bit. That's fine. That You just gave them the gospel. That is the gospel of the kingdom. The system out there, if I may speak generally, has not dealt with the kingdom as gospel. There's only one gospel. Be assured. There are not two gospels. But there is a system called dispensationalism, which decided, contrary to the Bible, that the gospel of the kingdom should only be preached to Jews. And then there's what they call the gospel of the grace of God, which is supposed to be for Gentiles. Now, that is absolutely devastatingly false, I have to say. There's only one gospel. It's the gospel of the kingdom as preached by Jesus. The beginning of the gospel, Mark 1, 1. Repent, it says in verse 14, and believe in the gospel of God. That's a wonderfully unifying phrase. God's gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. There's only one. And it's inviting you to kingship and managerialship, if that's the right word. The world is going to come under new management. And Jesus is that servant of God that we read about in Isaiah 49, who is going to supervise and bring into order out of chaos, just as God said, let there be light at the time when it was dark. Every day when the day dawns, you're to think of that new day coming. That wonderful word in the King James, the day spring from on high. The springing into new life every 24 hours. You're supposed to think of that great day coming, the only day in history that really counts. So this is what we're giving you here is the gospel. So, once again, to make our single very fundamental point, the gospel is not just Jesus died and rose. It is not just Jesus died and rose. That's an essential part of the gospel, but it's not the whole of the gospel because Jesus preached the gospel and sent his followers out to preach the gospel long before they'd even mentioned his death, which came later. So the death, that's the sacrificial, atoning death for your sins is vital to the gospel. But it's not the whole of the gospel. The gospel begins in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. That's our main thesis. Check it out. And I think you'll find it unites and unifies the gospel in one. As Carlos said so nicely, you have a front row seat for this now. You're able to watch this extraordinary theater this amazing drama work its way out and you'll understand what's going on. That's faith. Okay. Thank you, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have a comment here if you want to absolutely tackle these. Um, yeah. Someone in the chat, the beginning of the gospel does not start at Mark 1.1. 1, 1. It starts <laughs> at Genesis 3.15, yeah. the very first prophecy ushered. Well, that's, a, that's, that's also true. The new covenant time with Jesus, the beginning of the gospel, most important. If you want to add to that, Hebrews 1 
uh, sorry, Hebrews 2 verse 3 says, God spoke in the past. He certainly did. But now in these last days, speaks. And the beginning of his speaking in Hebrews 2 3, Hebrews 2 3 says, the beginning of that speaking was through Jesus. So, yes, there is a, a planned beginning, of course, in Genesis, but that all comes to complete fruition when Jesus begins to speak in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Show your friends because they don't necessarily understand this well. People have been told that Romans is the only thing that counts. Romans is brilliant, but it's not the only book in the Bible, nor is the Gospel of John. They are brilliant, wonderful books, but you can tell your friends simply this, that the Gospel begins in the New Testament times from the words and the lips of Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And finally, let me add this. If you want to show your friends how to put the Bible together again because it's been cut up into shreds by false systems, put it together again and show them Acts 20, verses 24 and 25. We can perhaps finish with this. Acts 20, Paul is resuming and recounting and reminding the elders as Ephesus there Miletus it is, yes. He's reminding them of what his ministry had been. So there in Acts 20, verses 24, we'll go to that one first of all. I consider my life of no value to me. If only I can finish my race. He's running a race, my course. If only I can complete the service I received from the Lord Jesus. What was it? It was a service of testifying, witnessing to the gospel, good news, gospel of the grace of God. I have seen people stop at that verse. In verse 25, he then defines precisely what that means. The gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have been preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I've got it. The gospel of the kingdom is precisely the same as the gospel of the grace of God. If you learned that one lesson today, you are way ahead, in a good sense, of many ignorant people who don't know that. So Acts 20, verses 24, 25, show your children, show your neighbors, and the Bible will be reattached into one unified whole. Thank you, Anthony. So, yep. yes, the Proto Evangelion. Yes. Genesis 3.15. Yes, I mean, that is the uh, event, mm. the gospel in its embryonic state, Absolutely. if you will. Absolutely. But yep. Yeah. So, all right. Thank you, Anthony. Good. We'll wrap it up here. Yes. And, thank uh, you. Time is upon us. Thanks so much. That's a lot of good work there. Isaiah is an incredible book. It is like a really like you're at the at the sports event, you know, at the most expensive, most important important sports event ever, and you're you got the front row seats. You got the VIP seats. I mean, it's incredible picture, and I highly recommend you read the, those passages again. Just go home and start with Isaiah uh, forty five. And, and work your way up and you get to those glorious servant of Yahweh or, or Jehovah uh, passages in the Isaiah 50 to 53 and so on. So, all right, we will wrap it up here. Before we go, we have some emails since we have some time here, some uh, email bag, as we call it. Um, let's see. I think... Uh, all right, this is one. This is from our YouTube uh, comments, by the way. So apologies, there are no names, just nicknames and things like that. Thank you, it says. The biblical Unitarian standpoint was a great thing for me to come across a few years ago. I'm still learning, but when I make a comment in favor of this standpoint, there are always some Trinitarian watchmen, sometimes a Muslim one, coming on in an aggressive tone. So there's war of opinions here, clearly. And it's all about Jesus Christ. What power did he have walking the earth? What are his powers now with God Almighty? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus is my Lord, not the 
lowercase l, and king, but still in heaven. He is not God the Father. So that's a good comment. Another one here on a video call, are Christians to love enemy more than self? Yes, excellent life-changing words. This is shining our lights in a dark world, loving those who persecute you. I often have the opportunity to do this as I share the gospel of the kingdom in the towns here in New Zealand. Blessings. Thank you for sharing another valuable teaching. Wow, all the way from New Zealand, we thank you so much uh, for listening. And actually, in um, that part of the world right now, it's a good time to be watching live, I think, or maybe not. It's early in the morning. So thanks for that. And uh, I think that's it. So I think we read those before. Okay, so let me share again the website since the topic came up. One of my pet projects, if you will, ChristEnemyLove.com. Remember, folks, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, you can have all the knowledge in the universe. You can have all the gifts, glossolalia, so-called tongues, miracles. You can raise the dead etc but if you do not have love you are nothing you are an echo you are a shadow so jesus practiced love on of enemy to his own death anthony read there from the great isaiah passage about the servant not even harming or breaking a reed you hear in those words jesus your lord the one you call lord he did not even break a reed so live try and live your life that way do not retaliate do not return evil for evil etc love your enemies the hardest probably teaching but it's an unqualified commandment the lord jesus gives in matthew 5 and i started this morning telling you that the lord jesus was under the new covenant jesus was under the new covenant law not the old covenant law obviously you cannot you know keep and not keep the 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 law of moses and the law of jesus you cannot be uh you cannot have two lords we know that saying very well so so uh jesus was the new covenant preacher he was not an old covenant keeper that he made allowances uh, at times, obviously, uh, for example, with the temple tax, uh, I believe it's Matthew 17. Uh, he obviously made allowances and said, look, let's just pay the temple tax. Let's not offend the tax collectors, the Jewish tax collectors from the temple. Okay, that's fine. I call that the diplomacy of Jesus. Just like we know about the diplomacy of Paul who is Jesus' agent, obviously. Don't believe anything we say. Check it out. Acts 17, 11 rule, remember. Nothing that you heard here today should be believed uh, outright. I expect you to do your own homework, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. No one else can. Only you can do that. All right, thank you so much. So we will wrap it up. Uh, again, the Theological Conference will be online May 27. Wow, not far to go. It's just a couple of months away. It's amazing. I will put out the list of speakers soon. So we have usually about 10 speakers or so. And that will be online. So everything is free. Everything is free. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to register. Remember, no registration needed. Just log on. Uh, bookmark uh, the, the site, theologicalconference.org. And uh, <clears throat> we will see you then. So we will close with prayer. And once again, we pray for everyone, everyone affected by this pandemic around the world, especially the poor countries.
third circle, world countries, and so on. So let's pray and, uh, and we'll close it out this Sunday. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for Anthony and the longevity, not only of his life, but his passion for your gospel about the coming kingdom of God. We thank all the viewers out there. We uh, ask you to bless them, keep them safe, healthy. <clears throat> we pray for the believers across the world, our lads, as I call them in the UK, the group there with Gus and everyone. We thank you for them and hope to be with them in the following weeks. And um, we ask you to keep them safe, keep them in the sound doctrine of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name we say, Amen. God bless everyone until we meet again.